Hey, I just want to take a moment and welcome every single person. Say hi to our Global X fam online. Everybody tuning in online. Would you just help me one more time? Because we just want to say to all those who are watching online. And by the way, we also, I want to say hi to all of those in correction facilities, prisons around Central Ohio, as we send this out to 11 different prisons so that people there can also get some hope through the message of Jesus. So if you're watching this, we just want to say, uh, hey, what's up? And we're glad that you'd connect with us today. And if you are here and you're new, I, I've got a little bit of bad news for you. You're kind of catching us on the last week of soul work. That's when you were supposed to go, oh, that's when you were, you didn't help me out here. This is the end of a journey. And it's not just a series, it's been a journey. It's, and for some of you that uh, don't love getting in touch with your soul, you could not be more excited to be done and out of the season. But I, I really feel very strongly that this is something that our church needs. I believe this is something all of us need, that at some point we've got to deal with our soul. At some point we've got to get to a place of emotional health, not just as we often think in church, spiritual health, but I really want us and I want all of you to get to a place of emotional health. Why? Because here's what we know, healthy things grow. Healthy things grow. And I know this is that I want to keep growing when it comes to the emotional side of my life. I, I don't want to just be someone who gets really smart and figures it out spiritually. And I know a lot of Bible verses, but when it comes to my emotional health or my EQ of my soul, that I'm still immature and a teenager, I don't want that. And so that's what our journey has been about. It's been a deep dive into the soul. I don't know, but I hope that it is transformed you. I hope if anything has gotten you to take a real introspective look at your life when it comes to your soul. Now today, as we close out this series, um, I want to speak to something that I'm going to share throughout is a little bit of a personal journey. In fact, this message might have a lot more of a personal connection to it than maybe even other ones because so much of what I want to share today has been something that God has been trying to teach me for years. And I just want you to know that I'm still in process with this, but something that I believe is so incredibly important when it comes to our soul. I don't know if you know this, but your soul has a speed. There's a speed to our souls. And I'm not really sure if the pace of our American life really is the appropriate pace for the human soul. I want you to understand, I think we probably already know this, but life feels hectic. I don't know if you feel that way, but can I just tell you I feel that way about life? Life to me feels like it is moving at a, an unstoppable pace, especially here in the American culture. In, in fact, you'll notice some differences if you get to travel abroad. And, and if you learn about other cultures, one of the things you'll discover is that Western culture is quite a bit different when it comes to pace than, say, Eastern culture or, I'll say, even other cultures. That there's something in the Western mindset. There's something in the, this life, this rat race we call the American way that we are born into. It's like we're born into a torrent of a river that is just moving at a rapid pace and we just fall into it. I know this to be true in my life and I imagine maybe many of you feel the same way. You ever feel like there's never enough time to get everything done? You ever feel like, like we're, there's always something else to conquer? There's always a bigger house to get. There's always a promotion to try to get. There's always something. We, are, we live in a time where we are just focused on building, building, conquering, uh, creating, just always trying to accomplish and achieve. And, and, and one of the things that we need to understand is that even the fastest cars on the track need a pace car. Even if you're in the NASCAR where they're running 200 plus miles an hour, there are times and there are moments when they need the pace car because the pace car means caution. And here's what I know when it comes to speed. Let me just say this personally. I feel like I am wired for speed. Is there anybody else here that would identify and say you are wired for speed if you're like me? I am, I was built for speed. Okay, I, I grew up and in, in, um, I learned to drive on the Autobahn. Okay, imagine that, right? Which is the greatest roads there are, okay, in the world, trust me. 
Uh, the greatest part about it is not having any real speed limits. There are some speed limits on the Autobahn. Uh, even some people don't know that. But, but I want you to know this, that all of the cars, because I first learned to drive in Germany, all of the cars that we own, I pegged all of them. Every single one. I, I got as fast as it could go, I made sure I could go that way. I was somebody who loves that. If I had the money to own a Porsche or a Ferrari, you better bet I would be driving one. Uh, or I wouldn't be driving at all because of the number of points on my license. One of the two would happen. But I have one speed and it is fast. In fact, if anybody that knew me when I was a kid, um, th this wasn't quite as common as it is today, but I I almost guarantee that I would have probably been diagnosed with ADHD. People said, you are hyperactive. You are crazy. You bounce off walls. You need to know something about me. I don't drink coffee to be like this. This is natural. I get up, I go, I run, I go fast. Like I'm designed to create. I'm an Enneagram three. We love to accomplish and achieve and to build and to amass and to lead and, to, and I am just made to go. So made to go. I, I have a fast walker. Do we have any fast walkers here today? Raise your hand. I love you all. I have a, I'm a fast walker. I have a big stride. You know what I mean? Like when I walk, this is normal for me. Cameras can't even keep up. This is normal for me. This is a normal pace. This is my normal walking pace. Whenever I'm with my wife and we're walking around, she's always one to two paces behind me. I like it that way. It's just kind of her way of honoring me. No, I'm just kidding. It's... <laughs> She's not here, I can say that in this experience. I'll cut that from the other one. I kind of feel bad at times because I feel like I don't, like it is almost impossible to walk. And she tells me she's a fast, like other women when she walks says that she's a fast walker. And she was like, you're impossible to keep up with. And so sometimes I'll be forced to walk with her. And this is what it feels like because I was built for speed. Now, let me just tell you something. The moment God uh, called me into ministry, I felt like it was God giving me a green light. And I like green lights. Okay, the moment he called me into ministry, it was like something inside took off. And it was like God releasing me, go, go build. Go do something. And I'll never forget the moment I was actually um, in God's word and I was reading this passage and something in, in like my intestines caught on fire. I, I don't know how, any other way to describe it, but there's a moment where maybe you could be reading the Bible and you know it was original to like Jesus' disciples. So I want to read this to you, my calling in the ministry. But I felt like in that moment God was speaking it to me. And it was John 15 verse 16. In John 15, 16, a verse that God used to ignite my passion for serving him, Jesus looked at his disciples and he said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. That's the way I felt in that moment. God, you're picking me. And I appointed you so that you might do what? Can you all say these words out loud with me? That you might go and bear fruit. That, that was what I felt like God had said to me. I want you to go and bear fruit. And it felt like in that moment that God gave me a charge. It felt like in that moment that God was like, green light, go Tim, go and bear fruit. I'd spent most of my life trying to do ministry, stuff, but I just had not seen the fruit. And I felt like God said, go and bear fruit. And guess what? That's what really initiated the birth of our church. All right, this church, X church, that's what initiated it was in that moment was I, I was like, all right, we're, we're gonna start a church. And the primary purpose is I'm gonna do things so that we have an opportunity to see fruit and fruit that will last, like life change in people's lives. And guess what? Can I just tell you the journey of our church, we have seen that. And I am so grateful. We have seen thousands upon thousands of people say yes to Jesus over the years. We baptized, okay, I, I, I've lost track, almost 2,000 people. Like, I'm just telling you like that God has borne fruit in this ministry. And when I went in full time, it was like, go. 
I mean, it was go. And then we moved to a new location in, in Lithopolis. And then we started a, a campaign six months after the campaign in that to expand it and do a kids facility and parking lot. And then after that, we did another expansion project in the auditorium. And in that same year, we launched a location in Lancaster. And then we also, right after that, bought property to build a new facility. And we have been running, running hard. And then in January of 2020, uh, God, God began to speak to me. In January of 2020, um, God actually spoke to me very clearly during our 21 days of prayer and fasting. That wasn't this year, that was last year. And I felt like God was screaming at me. I don't know if you ever felt like God screaming at you, like when it's like, okay, God, you're trying to say something. And I was reading some books, and I was doing this, and everything was coming together, and I felt like God said, Tim, you are striving so hard. I want you to stop striving, and I want you to start striding. I was like, huh? I did. I felt like he said, Tim, you are, you are running. And you have been going. This, this church, this ministry, was designed by a person who runs hard. You can ask the staff, like, we go, 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 build, build, expand, reach, do whatever. And I felt like God spoke to me and he said, stop striving and start striding. Now, I, I received this and I felt it so clearly in my spirit that, that I was wrestling with this through the 21 days of fasting. Wrestling with it. So it got so loud at one point that my workout equipment started speaking to me. You know, God can speak through a donkey. God can speak through an elliptical. God can speak through a lot of different things. No, I'm, I'm serious. I was one morning, I'm, I've been processing, processing all this, and I'm on an elliptical, and I'm just getting at it. Okay, that's what you do. I'm just getting at it for 30 minutes. I was running hard. On the elliptical, so I like to do in the morning and work out and get myself going. And as soon as I got done with the elliptical, in that moment, God spoke to me through it. A message popped up on the screen, and I knew it was God speaking to me. In fact, I took a picture of it, and I'm stick it up, put it up. This was the picture I took. That was on my elliptical during my 21 days of fasting. Stride. To continue, I looked at that and I went, oh God. <laughs> and I got off of it and I went, what are you, what are you trying to say to me? <laughs> Stride to continue. I literally felt like God was speaking to me so clearly in that moment. And I had essentially missed something with my calling. Imagine this, like decades later. It was so easy to pull out of the context that I missed something that Jesus had said to his disciples just a few verses before that. In John 15, verse 5, if you back up a little bit, Jesus said these words. He said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He said, if you do what? Everybody say that word out loud with me. If you, if you remain in me and I in you, notice what will happen. You will bear much fruit. Apart from me, he said, you can do nothing. Jesus wants to make sure that they understand, his disciples, that apart from me and my presence, you cannot bear fruit. You, you can't accomplish all that you think you can accomplish apart from me. Now, this is what's so crafty about Jesus, and this is what, what is so um, the juxtaposition of these two passages just jumped in front of me. In one moment, Jesus says, remain and bear fruit. A few verses later, he says, go and bear fruit. Which is it, Jesus? Are you confused? Do I remain or do I go? Do I stay and bear fruit or am I supposed to go and bear fruit? And the answer is yes. <laughs> am I supposed to remain or am I supposed to run? Yes. Yes. How do we bear fruit? Am I supposed to stay with him? Yes. But am I also supposed to go and bear fruit? Yes. What I believe Jesus was trying to show them that I all of a sudden had missed all this time was that Jesus was trying to show them a rhythm of rest. 
There's a rhythm to life. There's a rhythm of running and a rhythm of remaining. There's a rhythm of rest that he designed us for. This actually came to light for the disciples. In fact, I'll show you another example of this in Mark chapter 6. And just if you want to turn there in just a moment. But in Mark chapter 6, Jesus actually sent out his disciples in pairs. He had 12 of them. He sent out six groups, okay, two by two. And they went out into all these towns where Jesus had been ministering. And he said to them, I'm going to send you out to do what I was doing. So I want you to go out preaching. And I want you to go out and pray for the sick and see them get healed. And I want, I'm going to send, don't take anything for the journey. Just go and you're going to see incredible fruit. And so he sent them out. And they all went out. And the most incredible things happened when they were out. And all of a sudden, when they get done, they come back to Jesus in verse 30. I want to show you this. In verse 30, when they come back to Jesus, they're, kind of, they're all excited. They're amped up. They're telling them all about what happened while they were out doing ministry. In verse 30, it says that the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Look at all the stuff that we did. It was incredible. Verse 31, then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat. We're so busy running and doing. They didn't even get a chance to eat. And so he said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some what? You, you've been going. Now, now it's time to rest. And so they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. I want you to note the rhythm. What's the rhythm? Run, rest. Run, and rest. Can I just say this? In our culture, we know how to run. Can I ask you a question? Do you know how to rest? Or let me go a little bit deeper. Do you have a rhythm of rest in your life? See, I think a lot of times we go, well, we're going to go on vacation in, in like eight months. I know. But I, I'm asking a little bit more like, no, do, do you have like a normal rhythm of rest in your life? You see, God created your body to require rest. I think you know that, right? You ever notice that, um, like, you, you can't make it. Uh, you could try and stay up all night, or if you work at night, stay up all day. But at some point, you crash. Uh, God actually pre-wired us and created us to require rest physically. And sometimes I've been annoyed at having to sleep. Has anybody ever felt like that? I can think to myself, there's just not, have you ever said that there's not enough hours in the day? There, there's so, I got far more things on my list than I have time to accomplish. And sometimes I get annoyed that I have to sleep. I'm that kind of person, I'll stay up late, get up early. Okay, I go on four or five hours of sleep. That's what I, like, I am one of those people that's like, I fight sleep. I fight it. And I'll fall. I'll get sleepy about 10 o'clock every night because I get up real early in the mornings every night and I'll fight it and I'll doze off and I'll, uh, and I'll push it. And then I get my second wind. We wrote a song called Second Wind. It's all about getting your second wind. You know what I'm saying? Like I get my second wind. I'm good till 12, 1230. Sometimes one o'clock. Alarm goes off at 5, 515. And I'm like, okay, let's go get up and do it again. And sometimes I get mad that I have to sleep. It's a limitation. It's holding me back. There's so many more things I could do and I could build and I could create and I could write and I could. But I wonder if the very thing that we think is a limitation, what if it was actually considered a gift? I mean, God didn't have to make us so that we needed to replenish. I mean, he didn't have to. He could have made us so that we have like a renewable energy source within us. That would have been awesome. You know what I mean? Like a like an electric car that uses its brakes to recharge. You know, like, like he could have created us so, so, that we, so that we never had to sleep. Wouldn't that be amazing if you never had? Could you imagine instead of working, say, an eight-hour shift, you could work a 16-hour shift every day? Wouldn't that be incredible? And you'd still have time to go home. And, and, and imagine if you didn't have to, you know, sleep six hours, seven hours a day. You could spend all night cleaning your house. It'd be so clean and organizing your garage and working on your basement. I mean, doesn't that sound great? Does it? What if God designed us 
not to be limited by our energy that runs out unless it gets replenished. But what if God designed it as a gift? See, most of the time in our, our way of thinking, the Western culture, we don't see it that way. This was so significant to God that he actually had to turn this idea into a command for the nation of Israel. The, the Israelites, if you know their story from the Old Testament, they actually had spent generations that were enslaved in Egypt at a time, okay? And they were forced to work hard. No breaks and late days and seven days. Right? They were forced to work and work for the man. That was their life. They didn't get to enjoy it. They just had to build it for someone else. And when God brought them out of Egypt through all the miracles and the things, as he heard their cry, okay, when he took them into the desert before he gave them the promised land, which was considered the land of rest, God actually gave them some commands. He wanted to structure them to understand how he had created them to operate in life and in community. And the most significant ones that we know are considered the Ten Commandments, right? Actually, there's one specific command in the Ten Commandments that I want to read to you, though. And I know this is Old Testament, so everybody who's like New Testament and grace, we don't actually pay attention to those. But last time I checked, I still don't think we should murder people. So Exodus chapter 20, let me read verses 8 through 11, one of the Ten Commands. God said to them, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals. Come on, your animals, aren't they're, they've got to take some time off says, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and he made it holy. It has been pointed out that this one command is the longest of all 10 commands by the sheer amount of words. It's interesting. That in four words, God could say, don't kill people. But when it came to the Sabbath, he took almost 100 in your English Bible. Isn't that interesting? I wonder if it was actually significant to God, this command. Like, and if you wonder what God was pointing to as a reference when he talked about the Sabbath, he pointed to himself. What, what did he say? He said, for, for when God made everything, he created rhythm to life and creation. He created day and night. He worked for six, and God took off the seventh. What's he, what was he doing? He was showing them there's a rhythm. Now, I was reading a book on the Sabbath, and, um, and someone pointed out something that was kind of interesting. I, I want to just see if you would pick up on this, because I didn't. Adam and Eve according to the Genesis account, were created on what day? Do you know? If you know it, say it out loud. On the, the sixth day. Some of you weren't sure. Was it third, fourth? I don't remember. Okay. It was on the sixth day. On what day did God say he rested? What was the first full day that Adam and Eve enjoyed? It was the day of rest. You know, it's interesting. Most of us, when we think about this idea of rest or when God told them to do a Sabbath and all this, you know what we think about? You work really hard all week, and then you enjoy the weekend. It, it's like a reward for your work. But it wasn't that way for Adam and Eve. It was actually, I created you. Now, here's the first thing you do. Enjoy. Rest. Enjoy all that I've given you. Hold on. Before you go to work, Adam, before you do any of that, here's what I want you to do. Just be. Just rest. Just enjoy. Why is that so profound? Because listen, in our culture, and this is, I've struggled with this, we often confuse rest with laziness. This is what we do, right? It is a badge of honor to say, I work harder than everybody else. I put in more hours than anybody else in the office. I'm the first one in, the last one out. 
I'm the person that, man, I'm gonna work circles around you. And even when I'm not working, I'm thinking about work and I'm preparing because I wanna show the boss that I can do 70, 80 hours a week and I can accomplish and I can build and my sales will be better than everybody else and they'll wanna promote me and this is our mindset and this is what we do. Right? Can I just tell you something I'm learning? If you're a leader, if you're a supervisor, a manager, and you're looking to hire, and you see anybody in your office or around that's putting in for it, and you see them and they work harder than anybody else, and they put in more time, and they're at the office at six in the morning, and they don't leave till seven o'clock at the evening, be very careful of that person. No, 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 they, they accomplish a lot. I want that person. I know, that's what you think right now. Wait till they burn out because we weren't created to run at that pace. Now, I know immediately something in all of us, we, we start hearing this, we're like, well, man, I, I don't have time for this, oddly enough. You know what's interesting is you follow this picture of the Sabbath from Genesis before the law, okay? So if you're one of those, I don't do Old Testament law stuff, it was before the law. If you follow this all the way up to the time Jesus showed up, what you discover is that religion actually turned the Sabbath into something that it really wasn't meant for or intended. That's what religion does, by the way, if you're kind of new to church. Religion, if you've ever been around sometimes, you go, I don't like church. A lot of times what you're really expressing is you don't like religion because a lot of times that's what we do in church. And man, we, we kind of lump all of our other rules and we create all this thing. And I read to you what God said to them, but then you know what the religious did was then they took it to the nth degree. They went, oh, you're not allowed, you gotta stop doing anything. They, they would have rules that say you can only take so many steps before you're breaking the Sabbath. You can only walk so far. So make sure you're close to home when sun goes down on Friday. You know, it's interesting. I went to Israel a couple years ago and our, our leader, our guide, who was a Christian, but a Jewish guy that lived in Jerusalem. And he was telling me at one point, we were on a bus ride and he was telling me about the Sabbath. And, and, and all of them still in Jewish culture, still they celebrate the Sabbath. It's like Friday night, that's when their Sabbath begins. The sun goes down and everybody's in their homes and businesses shut down. Kind of reminds me of what it used to be like in America years and years ago on Sundays, okay? It's not like that anymore, right? But the, everything was shut down. And he told me there was some really interesting rules that they had with the Sabbath. The house. There's a lot they love about it. I, I can understand why. I think it would be great if we could do that. I mean, but here, here's what he told me. He said, um, they make sure before the sun goes down, they set all the lights the way they need them for the entire next day. Because they thought, they say you're breaking the Sabbath if you flip a light switch. I'm like, wow, that's interesting. So maybe bedrooms lights off, all the rest of them lights on so you don't touch any light switches, right? He also said this, you can watch TV all day. Some of you are like, oh, I could do that kind of Sabbath. You can watch TV all day. Here's the only rule. You can't change the channel. Better pick the channel you really want to watch. Man, if the Buckeye game was on 10 and I had it on four, gosh, that would have awful, right? Like, and, and, and what I think happened was religion happened. And it actually became oppressive and it became legalistic and it became something really like they missed the boat. And so here's what Jesus did. When Jesus showed up, he came to restore what religion confused. That's what Jesus did. When he showed up, let, let me tell you one of the things he did. He went into, they, they go to worship on the Sabbath. It was their church. That's what they do. It's part of the Sabbath was to be honoring God and worshiping him. And they would go. And one time he was in a church on the Sabbath and he healed a guy's shriveled hand. And the religious leaders were so mad. How dare you heal, create, restore on the Sabbath? They got mad at him. And it says they went out and they plotted his murder. I found it interesting that you can't heal on the Sabbath, but you can plan a murder. That I found fascinating to me. What happens is it gets twisted. Sometimes what, what we have done when it comes to what God has spoken is that we, uh, we, we focus on the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. That's what the New Testament helped us. That's what Jesus helped us understand. And um, one moment, Jesus was also walking through a field with his disciples. Again, you weren't supposed to walk a certain number of paces. They were hungry. So they picked some grains, okay, off of the stalks, and they were eating them as they go. And the religious got mad. How dare they do that? You can't do that on the Sabbath. 
And Jesus said something really fascinating. I want to read this to you, Mark chapter 2. I know this is not just one little passage, but I'm just trying to, I'm trying to tell a story with this. In Mark chapter 2, here's what Jesus said, verse 27. Then he said to them, the religious, the Sabbath was made for whom? The Sabbath was made for man. Can you guys put the verse up, please? Mark, that would help for you guys don't have the verse up. Thank you. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for whom? For man. Listen, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. This is really important. What's he trying to help us see? Is that God created the Sabbath for us and our gift and our intent, not for some rule for his pleasure. That God created all of this idea of rest and pull away and stop working. He did it for you and he did it for me and for our benefit. And you know what, here's what's interesting. This is the only one of the 10 commandments that us as the New Testament church actually celebrate not keeping. Like it's a badge of honor even in the Christian church that we celebrate it. Isn't that funny? We're like, well, make sure you don't lie. I mean, that is true. And, and don't covet your neighbor and your neighbor said, that is all good and true. And we're to worship God and him, no one else. And honor your parents. These are all good. The Sabbath, oh, that's old. We don't do that. Jesus said, no, you don't understand. You've twisted it. I created this for your benefit because you need it. And so in 2020, um, what I think God was trying to show me was that my pace was not his rhythm. And I was doing good stuff. I'm trying to build his kingdom through the church. I'm working hard. And I'm running, and I felt like God was saying to me, yeah, but your pace is not my rhythm. God's not calling us to slow. Don't get this, don't, don't get this mixed up. God's not calling me to slow down. God's not saying, okay, I need you to walk slow all the time. Here's what he's telling me. You can run, but you also need to rest. I want, you can build and go hard. But there's got to be for your soul a day when you, every week, there's gotta be a rhythm where you also stop building and you rest in me and it's a gift, it's a gift. So this was all my, this was everything God was speaking to me and I was like, I've gotta reorient my entire life. That was January of 2020. Guess what happened March of 2020? COVID, COVID happened. You know the fascinating thing about COVID, right? I know it's awful, this pandemic, and I think in our, especially our Western culture, it was a real struggle. Quarantine, lockdown, cancel sports, cancel activities, cancel school in person, cancel all, everything shut down. Now, I don't believe that God caused it. I don't. But I wonder if God wanted to use it to get our attention. Everything shut down. And then guess what we did? We complained. We complained about being stuck, not being able to run and do. Why? Because we're wired for that, especially in the Western culture. And what should have been like, hey, Tim, I'm trying to get, and I don't believe God caused the pandemic all to speak one thing to me. Okay, I'm just gonna say it. But I feel like God was speaking to me and say, slow down. Can I just tell you from my perspective in ministry, it did anything but slow down. In fact, I felt last year I ran harder than I had run in a long time. I am trying to, and if you had to lead an organization, probably specifically, you probably felt the same way. You're just trying to, how do I keep things going? How do we continue to be the church and minister? How do we continue to make sure we're connecting with people? How do we make sure that we're serving people in such a unique way? How do we, and it was just run, 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 to figure out church online, figure out how to do all this stuff. And it was, it was a frenetic pace last year. And then as we, we're ready to come back to church. We made a decision to come back. We had to make a really, really hard decision to come back to one location instead of two. I was thinking, man, we built two and we're running two and teams for two. But we felt very clearly we were supposed to be one. We said we didn't know how long, but we, we didn't anticipate it. We didn't have the resources to do church in two locations. We, have, we had this building that was about to come. We had all this stuff, and so we had to make a hard decision to go from two down to one. Wow, never anticipated that, never did. And then we opened this new building 
in the fall. And I, I can just tell you, leading up to it, can I just tell you, it was probably one of the busiest seasons of my life. Not only are we trying to figure out how to do ministry, but at the same time, I also have meetings with the builder every single week, daily. I'm having conversations. Do you want this or this? Is this wrong? No, this isn't right, but we need to get this installed. And I'm sitting here trying to manage this project at the same time. It's consuming every ounce of my life. We restructure our staff and all these, because of this this year. And then we got into the new building and something changed. I don't know how to describe this. Something changed to me. Um, the end of the year, last year, for the first time in a long time, I actually could, I could actually breathe. I really could. I wasn't trying to figure out how to get the building. We got into the building. And we had to restructure. I was upset. We had to go from two locations down to one location. But the restructuring actually freed me up. And it, for the first time in a long time, I had something called margin. I had not had margin in so long. And can I tell you what happened? I started to receive inspiration from God that I hadn't had in a long time. All of a sudden, like, I felt like I was hearing from God so clearly. I felt like he was giving me ideas of where we're going as a church. Like, all of a sudden, like, inspiration began to fill back up inside of me, all because of margin. Can I just tell you, this is so counterintuitive to culture. I get it. Culture says, the more you do, the more you bear. Do more, bear more fruit. Run harder, reach further. That's what culture says. But I never realized what God had promised with this command. If I could just show you this again, because it was so easy to miss, also in Genesis chapter 2 and Exodus chapter 20. The very end of that command, I want you to hear, this is the same thing that God said in Genesis chapter 2. Here's what God said. He said this, Therefore, the Lord did what to the Sabbath? Everybody say that word out loud. The Lord blessed the Sabbath, and he made it what? He blessed the Okay, this almost does not make sense. But here's what God was saying. If you will set aside, that's what the word holy means. I'll bless it. If you will put the Sabbath a day, a week aside, I'll bless it. And all of a sudden I realized something. This is the exact same thing that God said when it comes to our finances. God said the same thing about the first fruits. He said, it's holy, it belongs to me, the first fruit. He said, if you will honor me holy, set it aside to give the first 10%, not just 10%, the first 10%, if you will honor me with it, God said, I will bless the rest. And here I am as someone who for years has enjoyed the blessing of giving the first fruits where I would sit here and I would tell you that my 90% with God's blessing, it goes way further than 100% of what I could do on my own. There are hundreds of people that would probably sit here and tell you that. And yet when it comes to my energy and my time, I just decided that I got to do it. Wow. You know, a great um, real life example of this uh, is an Old Testament prophet said these words, closed on Sunday, I'm your Chick-fil-A. You know what I'm talking about? You know what's interesting about Chick-fil-A and their owner? that from its inception, they decided that they weren't gonna be open one day a week on Sunday. They were Christians and said, that was our Sabbath. We're not gonna work on that one day a week. That's what everybody knows. You mentioned Chick-fil-A and everybody knows closed on Sunday. They're always closed on Sunday, right? You know what's interesting? As I was looking at the revenue in 2019, per location, Chick-fil-A does more gross revenue than any of the other fast food restaurants around. Hey, they're Christian chicken. We can celebrate that. Listen to me, not by a little, by a lot. It's been estimated that they are losing somewhere around a billion dollars a year 
potential and revenue by being closed on Sunday. And yet they still make more money than every McDonald's location, Burger King location, Taco Bell location. How is that? What I'm saying, is it possible that God, when he says, I'll bless the Sabbath if you will honor it, that you can see the hand of God in your life? Come on. And so this year, I, uh, I decided that I, I was going to commit to creating a Sabbath in my rhythm, a weekly Sabbath. And uh, I changed the language a little bit. I call it my soul day. I need a soul day. You need a soul day. Can I just tell you, you need a soul day? Because your soul wasn't designed to run at the speed of the current of our culture. You need a soul day. And it's a day out of the week. And sometimes, listen, here's what I don't do. I don't get legalistic about it. I'm intentional, but I'm not legalistic about it. I take one of my days, it's a day off, and it's, for me, I'm working on Sunday. But for you, maybe Sunday's maybe a great day for it because it's also part of your worship too. And um, I, I intentionally, God has spoken to me about being intentional, about allowing my soul to breathe to rest, to stop thinking about work, stop thinking about projects around the house. Amen, guys, this is a good one for you. To, to, and to find a day where you can simply enjoy what God has created for you and enjoy him and enjoy your family and enjoy life. What is it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his soul? Are we running so that we gain the whole world but we, we maybe lose something even better? And I wanted to share with you as I close three just quick things to help you. If you say, I want to be a part of that journey. I need a soul day. I'm just going to say it. You need a soul day. You can do what you want with this. It's between you and God. But I, I don't know that we were supposed to throw this away when we moved into the New Testament. I, I don't know when Jesus said he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's also the Lord of the harvest. He is a God over the work and the labor, but he's also a God over the rest. And, and maybe it was made for you. <laughs> and, and so three thoughts that kind of I use to help create my soul day that maybe it'll help you. First one is this. I would encourage you, do things you enjoy. Why not? Life's too short. Do things you enjoy. What do you love to do? I encourage you families. What do you love to do? You like go see movies? Go see a movie. Well, on the Sabbath, we just got to sit at home with candles and read our Bible. No. I, can, I just, can I be honest with you as a pastor? I would not enjoy doing that all day long. I would not, okay? Go see a movie. Go to a park. Go, go to King's Island. Yeah. I don't think there has to be a limit to the number of steps you take if you're at King's Island. Go do something you enjoy something fun. When do you plan time for fun? When you get up with your kids, maybe it's going to be on Sunday before you go to church, or maybe it's after church. You're going to, we're having a fun meal. We're going to have pancakes. We're going to have, we're going to do something fun. Do something you enjoy. Why? Because I look how God created Adam and Eve. And the very first day, it was like, have fun, guys. God wants you to enjoy his creation. Maybe it's getting outside. Maybe it's going someplace and do something you want to do. That's what I'm saying. Plan it. Be intentional. That's the first thing. Do something you enjoy. Second one is this. Disconnect from work, social media, or maybe even outside noise. Disconnect. Every wife is like, please, dear God, may my husband disconnect. Or maybe it's the other way around. Please, Lord, let my wife leave her job and come home and stop, you know, for one day. Disconnect from work. I'm not going to do work email. I'm not going to do work calls. You tell, now, I understand you might have a job, you're on the call, you're going to have to some, allow some flexibility. That's fine. But for the most part, figure out this as a rhythm. I want to encourage you, disconnect from social media. I'm not getting on social media today. Disconnect from social media for one day. Disconnect, maybe it's outside noise. Why? Because your, your spirit, for it to connect with God, sometimes you're going to have to get rid of all the noise. 
And I think we're so bombarded by the noise of our culture that what does it look like for one day? Maybe you're just gonna, maybe you shut off all your phones but one in case there's an emergency. You tell family, friends, or whatever. Or maybe you're gonna put them all on do not disturb for the day, but you can see it if something happens. I'm just saying, what does it look like to disconnect? And then the third one is this, discover a new pace. This is the one that God used for me. So this is, we're not being legalistic, but we're gonna be intentional. Discover a new pace. My pace is always go. And, and I wonder if God used COVID and restructuring and all of these things as a pace car in my life. When's the pace car come out? It comes out when there's a wreck. Maybe God puts out a pace car before we wreck, I would hope. And, and, and this is the big one for me. I move at a different pace on my soul day. My wife, one day I was, I was just doing this, just started into this. And my wife and my youngest daughter, they were um, gonna go shopping all day long. And it was the day I set for my soul day. And I was okay with that. And right before my wife left, she looked at me and she said, hey, hey we're gonna be gone. Can you mop the floors while we're gone? I looked at her and I said, no, this is my soul day. Yeah. Guess what I did that day? But, but I did, something was different inside me. You see, I, 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 she was fine with it. I didn't do it because I had to. I did it because I wanted to. I actually, I changed my pace. I put in my AirPods. I put some worship on and I took my time and I worshiped while I mopped the floors. That's what I did. And can I tell you, it didn't drain me. It actually filled me up. And I realized that I can do a lot of things with a different pace. Sometimes we go to the grocery store on the Sabbath day, soul day, but I move at a real, I don't walk a step in front of her. I move at a real slow pace. We don't tackle it. Normally I say, you go to that end of the store. I go to this end of the store. You got the list, we'll meet in the middle. Nope, guess what we do? We meander through the, hall, through the uh, aisles. Do we need that? I don't know, do we need that? And guess what? It's a different pace. And I realized something. I think God's trying to teach us all something. I hope you get this as we close out this series because your soul needs some rest. Your soul needs rest. And God spoke to me one day about my purpose. And he said, Tim, what do you think your purpose is? Well, you called me to... I didn't say what I called you to do. I said, what do you think your purpose is? I want to build your kingdom. No. Your purpose isn't anything you do. It's who you are. It's who I created you to be. And I'm in a place where I'm trying to just come to grips with being okay to, I'm Tim, the son of God, who can, who can just be with God. And I don't have to accomplish a certain thing by the time I'm 68 years old. And I don't have to say that I did this, that I can just, I can find my peace in just who I am with God. Can I tell you that's liberating? It's liberating in every sense of the word. And I just, my great desire is to close this series is that God would just give you peace and purpose to find rest in your soul. Man, would you all stand to your feet with me? And I wanna pray and I wanna pray God's blessing over you. Today is, is Sunday. It's a, a day of worship. That's part of maybe Sabbath. But I want this to be rest for you. So if you bow your heads and just allow me to pray over you. Father, I'm so grateful for the things that you've taught me. And I realize, God, that I've been running at a pace that is not your rhythm. And God, as I'm in process and growing in this, Lord, I pray that right now freedom comes through your spirit. That God, I pray that this word has not come heavy with conviction or condemnation, those things, that's not of you, God. But I do pray that maybe we are challenged by your spirit, that we would honor you 
And that we would put aside some time, God, to say, this day is a soul day. This is a Sabbath day where I honor you and I honor what you created, the gift that you created me to experience in this life. And so God, I pray right now, rest over your people. Thanks so much for tuning into this message. I hope that it encouraged you and inspired your faith. If God is doing something in your life, would you take a moment and let us know? We wanna connect with you and we wanna be able to pray for you. All you have to do is shoot us an email to hello at the x.church or you can always send us a DM on one of our social media platforms. And if you know somebody that would also be encouraged by this very message, why not take a moment and just share it with them right now? And as always, I wanna say thank you to every single person who so generously financially supports this ministry so we can continue to get messages like these out to people all over the world. We believe God is building something special and you're a significant part of it. Until next time, have a great day.